repeat after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly When George swear. W. Bush took office in 2000, he brought with him some of the most conservative foreign policy voices in the Republican Party. Chief among them were Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and Deputy Secretary for Defense Paul Wolfowitz, all of whom had served together previously in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Paul Wolfowitz, in particular, had long been recognized as the intellectual force behind a radical neoconservative fringe of the Republican Party. For years, Wolfowitz had been advancing the idea that the United States should reconsider its commitments to international treaties, international law, and multilateral organizations such as the United Nations. You know, so this is a, not just a Republican takeover. This is a very specific wing of the Republican Party. It's neoconservative, it's unilateralist, it doesn't believe in the rule of law, it doesn't believe you have to tell the public the truth. And I happen to be an extremely uh, arrogant, dangerous group of reactionary status. Uh, they're not conservatives. They have a political agenda with regards to foreign policy that they had been working on for years and years, uh, and, and writing about this, and, and, and saying this is the post-Cold War vision. This is our post-Cold War vision for American power. Ever since the Cold War ended, there were people who were fuming on the right, thinking this is the golden opportunity now that Russia's out of the way for America to take over the world. We're not doing anything about it. Those damn liberals, those soft heads, are keeping us from doing what is our godly mission. A radical plan for American military domination first surfaced during the administration of George H.W. Bush. In 1992, Paul Wolfowitz, working in the Department of Defense, was asked to write the first draft of a new national security strategy, a document entitled The Defense Planning Guidance. The most controversial elements of what would later come to be known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine were that the United States should dramatically increase defense spending, that it should be willing to take preemptive military action, and that it should be willing to use military force unilaterally with or without allies. This new reliance on military force was necessary, according to Wolfowitz, to prevent the emergence of any future or potential rivals to American power, and to secure access to vital resources, especially Persian Gulf oil. This caused uproar when it was leaked and the Europeans got upset, and people like Colin Powell and George Herbert Walker Bush, and to some extent even Cheney said, you know, this is kind of out there, guys. You gotta, you gotta tone that down. Because, you know, the end of the Cold War is not necessarily a green light for us to go ballistic and, you know, building up our military and, and pushing countries around using, you know, uh, the sword rather than uh, diplomacy. But this, these guys never let go of that. William out of power during the Clinton presidency, Wolfowitz and his colleagues affiliated themselves with a number of influential conservative think tanks. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy. This one published by a right-wing think tank, calling itself the project for the new American century. At its core, the document revived the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to $100 billion, to deny other nations the use of outer space, and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. They were coming out against the policy of every American president, from Nixon to Clinton to even George Bush in his first year. They wanted to change that. But even these hardline conservatives knew that the Wolfowitz Doctrine was likely too radical to win the support of the foreign policy establishment, their own Republican Party, and the American people. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent, in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive.
uh, the whole of Congress has been evacuated. A number of congressional, senior congressional figures are calling this America's Pearl Harbor. There are few words to describe the depth of this tragedy. It's an attack on the United States that we haven't seen really since Pearl Harbor. This is this comparable to an attack on uh, Pearl Harbor? And it must have the same response, and the people who did it must have the same end as the people who attacked Pearl Harbor. But it isn't just the people who did it, it's the people who make it possible. These are the governments that harbor those who carry out these attacks. That harbor or, or encourage them with their propaganda. You know, it's like a Pearl Harbor, like a new form of a war, or like a terrible new arm. And we have to take it very seriously. This is, this is an act of war. When they compare this to Pearl Harbor, I don't think they're wrong in the sense that it's a surprise attack. And I suspect, if we are wise about this, Pearl Harbor brought the American people together and made us recognize we had something we had to deal with. Perhaps this will do the same thing for all of us. It's clear now, as it was uh, on December 7, 1941, the United States is at war. The question is with whom? Senator Dodd earlier today uh, compared this to the equivalent of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Right, and you know, he said, I don't think that overstates it. We may find out it will understate it. In this sense, I do think it's like Pearl Harbor, because it's Pearl Harbor that led us all to, to come together to defend ourselves against the Japanese. I think this is Pearl Harbor, in a sense, in bringing us now to look at this terrorist issue. Um, the United States, I don't think, has decided on an, op on an option, but if we use the Pearl Harbor analogy, once the United States decides, it will act ruthlessly and, eff and effectively and, and will deal with this terrorist um, threat to the best of its capability. And if we find the governments have harbored or supported the terrorists in any way, I think th those governments become extremely vulnerable at that point. You were assessing intelligence, fearing something one day like this might happen in your National Security Council. Is this the doomsday scenario? Nick, this is about as close to the doomsday scenario as, uh, as could be contemplated. So what I want to stress here is that any nation, and this goes for the Taliban and their uh, henchmen in Afghanistan, any nation in the world that harbored anyone associated with this must be treated as though they were part of what is effectively an act of war against the United States. And I repeat this again, any nation that is seen to have harbored or abetted or sheltered any of these people must be treated as co-equally responsible. Then the next step will have to be a, a, a program to attempt to eradicate the source of this and to uh, bring pressure and serious pressure on governments that harbor uh, this kind of organization and especially governments where we suspect that these organizations are located. Uh, between the governments that harbor terrorists and our government, other Western governments, and particularly people that in the past have supported terrorists and given them harbor, a safe harbor, and uh, helped them in some way. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. When the president said, we will make no distinction between the terrorists and those who harbor him, I think that's very much the point he was making. Uh, we will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. There, there would, no distinction would be made between the terrorists who committed yes. these acts and those who harbored them. We need to put people on notice that if they harbor terrorists, they are going to get it from us. And we have to make a statement that is so strong that any country that harbors the state that harbors them is as responsible as those who commit it I think it go beyond harboring the president said harbor but I think those who finance them those who train them that we would make no distinction between those who uh, carried out these deeds and those who harbored them what we are seeing now is nothing less than the worst nightmare that one could imagine come to life probably worse than anyone could have imagined and I I hate to say it this way, but this may be the day that America's luck ran out.